during the 2000, year 2000 presidential election, that he gave a speech about how faith in God was important to him. And in an attempt to convince the American people that he should be the next president, he announced that his favorite Bible verse was John 16.3. Well, that's interesting because the speechwriter had meant to write John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And that's what he had meant to make reference to. But Mr. Gore really didn't know his Bible that well. And said his favorite verse was John 16.3, which ironically said, They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Talk about irony. <laughs> Talk about self-revelation. And talk about how people say the dumbest things. As we continue to examine the life of Moses, we hear a number of really dumb things being said. And we're going to explore that this morning. Sounds like the platform for a great spiritual message, doesn't it? People say the dumbest things. Well, let's see. In Exodus chapter 8, we can read about God using Moses to provoke the king of Egypt to let the Hebrew slaves go from Egypt. And the provocation that Pharaoh was facing were a succession of 12 plagues issued by God through Moses and his rod. God has used Moses in a number of ways, and at this stage, Pharaoh is facing the plague of frogs. How many of you love frogs? A few of you love frogs. How many of you detest frogs? No detesters of frogs. If Ollie was here, that picture would almost make her run out of the sanctuary. All right. Why did God plague Egypt with frogs? Well, in Egypt, frogs were associated with the god Happy, not as in Happy, but pronounced happy, and the goddess Hat, who was believed to assist at childbirth, and thus the frog gods were symbols of fertility. So by plaguing Egypt with frogs, God was basically saying, you think that your worship system, your gods are powerful? Try this on for sucks. God was demonstrating himself as being the one and only true God. And the actual a translation for frogs in the scriptures is croakers, which means bullfrogs. So we're not talking about those little leopard frogs or those little ones that you find down by the creek. We're talking about the big ones that you can boil in your pot and they say it tastes like chicken. It, it tastes like bullfrog. <laughs> when I was a young boy, I spent my summers at a cottage near La Fontaine, Ontario, and down um, near the lake, there was this area that was kind of a marsh. There was a little creek and there was a marsh. And I would spend the occasional day down there catching frogs. Now, I don't care for frogs that much, but if you're swift, you can use a couple buckets and you can collect a lot of frogs. You come up in front of them, they turn around, they go the opposite direction, they jump right into the bucket. So I had collected a lot of frogs and I set those bucket of frogs behind the cottage and I went to bed that night in the upper bunk and I dreamt. I dreamt that the frogs got out of the bucket. I dreamt that the frogs had crawled out of the bucket and into the cottage and they were all over me. I had frogs in my dreams. It was so creepy. I didn't go catching frogs for a while. For Pharaoh, it wasn't a dream, however. Bullfrogs were everywhere. They were in his food, bullfrogs in his bedding, frogs in his clothes, frogs in the cupboards, frogs filled the bath water. Everywhere there was frogs. It was a plague of frogs. They were even his mind because they were croakers, so at night they kept, you know how frogs are, bullfrogs at night. They were everywhere. And then he says a very dumb thing. When he's given the opportunity to get rid of the frogs, he answers Moses by saying, we'll get rid of them tomorrow. He says, tomorrow. When faced with the decision as to when he wanted them removed, he answers Moses, tomorrow. 
I mean, why would he procrastinate and perpetuate his misery? Why would he wait a second, let alone an hour or another full 24 hours tomorrow? But this is what he says. And maybe putting off something important, procrastinating is something that you do. Anyone? Procrastination is my sin. It brings me on the sorrow. I really must stop doing it. In fact, I'll start tomorrow. Pharaoh's answer is really no different than those who have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. They become aware of God's forgiving love and all that is needed is that they receive that gift. But they say to themselves, they say to those around us, I'm just not going to do it right now. I'm not ready. I'll do it tomorrow. Just as a drop of food coloring in water will affect the whole glass, so it is when Adam sinned, the first man sinned, it affected all of us. And we were born with a sinful nature. Every one of us stand in need of a Savior, don't we? We ratify our sinful nature by actually sinning. Any here, anyone here without sin? Be careful, because the Bible says if you say that, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. We have all sinned. But then Christ gave his life so that the whole world could be reinfected with, with his blood, his righteousness. But each of us must receive this new color. So the question is, is when should we respond to God's forgiving love? Well, not tomorrow. That's about as dumb a thing as you can say. The Bible says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Our life is but a vapor. The Bible emphasizes today, Joshua said, as for me and my house, or actually we will serve the Lord, and he goes on to say, choose this day, choose this day whom you will serve. And the Apostle Paul wrote, I tell you now, that now is the acceptable time of salvation. Now is the day of salvation, not tomorrow or some day off in the distance. It's the same lesson we learned in science class, with a frog. You put a frog in a, in a beaker, fill it with water, light the Bunsen burner underneath, and as that water heats up, that frog has an opportunity to jump out and to save its life. But because the heat rises so slowly, the frog misses the opportunity and boils to death. Some of us put off what we should do, and there comes a moment of it being too late. So Pharaoh answered tomorrow, and it was the dumbest thing that had ever been said in the Bible to that point. Another little limerick. Mr. Mentu has a comrade, and his name is Didn't Do. Have you ever chanced to meet them? Did they ever call on you? These two fellows live together in the house of Never Win, and I'm told that it is haunted by the ghost of Might Have Been. Tomorrow. People say the dumbest things. The next dumb comment is found in Exodus chapter 16. The slavery conditions in Egypt had been so bad that under the taskmasters, the Egyptian taskmasters, men and women who were Hebrews died. They were so desperate that they cried out to God for mercy and for rescue. God answered using Moses. And Moses effectively led the slaves out of Egypt, and once through the Red Sea they began to travel through a wilderness area, and along the way there were some hardships. Food and water, for example, were in short supply. And instead of asking God to provide for their needs, they began to grumble against Moses. They began to complain against God. Reminds me of a, a humorous anecdote about a monk who, who took a vow of silence. Except every year on the same date, he was allowed to say two words to the friar. So after the first year of his, of his vow of silence, he, he had his two words to say to the friar, and he said, bad food. And then he was quiet again for another year. The second year, he said, hard bed. And then come the third year, he said, I quit. The friar said, good, because all you've done since you've got here is complain. <laughs> the Israelites complained about everything, and they complained about their food. So here we go, Exodus 16.3. They began to say, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. 
There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into the desert to, to, to starve this entire assembly to death. So God then gave them manna. He gave them quail. He gave them food that would, that would nourish them. But then they got bored of their food. And in Numbers we read, they began to crave other food. And they started wailing, saying, if we only had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlics. But now we've lost our appetite because we never see anything but this manna. So you need to think about this for a millisecond. They were so desperate. They were so miserable in Egypt that they cried out, God, out to God for deliverance. And God had parted the Red Sea for them. He had directed them by, with a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day. He had provided manna for them. He had provided quail for them. He gave them water gushing out of a rock. And because they were bored of their menu, they said, Oh, we, should, we wish we were still in Egypt. They had forgotten that quickly how miserable it was back then. But for the sake of variety of the dish, they, they wanted to be back in Egypt. Talk about a dumb thing. Franklin D. Roosevelt used to say, nothing is so responsible for the good old days as a bad memory. I like this. It's one thing to get in the shower and forget, forget which pocket you put the soap in. But how could you forget the emptiness of life before God came to you? Egypt is a metaphor of our lives before we met Christ. How miserable and how empty they were. The wilderness is a metaphor of the journey we must take to be where God wants us to be. And even though we have been living our old life in ways, there may have been moments along the way where you began to romanticize the way it used to be. Your life of sin. Doing things the way you wanted all the time. Oh, I wish I could go back. You know, again as a child, I, at this cottage, I, I grew up and on certain days we wanted to go to the basin and the basin was actually just a little inlet in Georgian Bay, but there was a convenience store there, so we just called the convenience store the basin. And we wanted to go to the basin, but it was two and a half miles away. But as a 10 year old, 11 year old boy, we would decide to hike it and go. And it would all, it'd be full sun, it'd be gravel roads, but we'd make our way to the basin. We get halfway there and we think, why did we ever, why did we ever begin this journey? Because we were so hot and we were so thirsty. But there was one reason why we kept on going. It's because at the basin there was great pop. And the other reason is is we had gone too far to turn back. So we might as well complete our mission. And there was no great pop back at the cottage. So we pressed on. Why do we press on in following the Lord? I'll tell you one thing. Because there's no great pop back in your old life. The blessing of God was in your journey with Him. And you've gone too far to turn back. It would be dumb. So stop romanticizing life without God and, and fulfilling your, life, your appetites in, in sinful ways. It's completely ridiculous. We've come too far to turn back. But that's what the Israelites started to say. Oh, if we could just be slaves again. The last dumb statement found in Exodus, is found in Exodus 32. And this is really dumb. This is spoken by Aaron's brother. Now you need to know that the Ten Commandments were given to Moses up on top of Mount Sinai. And so Moses is up there receiving these commandments, and the first commandment is that you should have no other gods before you, and you should not make any graven image is the second. Powerful commandments. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, and he sees that the people have already turned their attention away from God, and they're already breaking the first two commandments. They're dancing around, having this celebration around a molded golden calf. Moses is so infuriated by their behavior that he actually throws the commandments on the ground, the tablets, and they're, they're shattered. 
They have to be redone at a later date. He approaches Aaron and he says, what on earth is going on here? And, and Aaron says, well, they wanted to have something they were worship. We weren't sure, Moses, that you were coming back. And so the people wanted me to do something on their behalf. And so I asked them to give me their gold and we put it into this, into this fire. And in verse 24, he says, out came this calf. We put all the gold into a pot and ta-da, out came this calf. In other words, it's not my fault. It's the dumbest excuse you have ever heard. It was a straight-faced lie. If there was the word abracadabra in, was in vogue, it would have been in the scripture right there. Aaron was trying to make himself look good, but what he was doing is offering a lie in order to sidestep blame. And it's a very dumb thing to try to cover up your wrongdoing before an all-seeing, all-knowing God. God wanted Aaron, and he wanted Mr. Al Gore, and all of us to come clean. We must not insult the intelligence of God. He knows. He simply knows. A duke boarded a galley ship. He went below to talk with the criminals that were manning the oars. He inquired of their offenses. All of them claimed that they were innocent or that they were there because of an injustice. Only one person answered, Sir, I deserve to be here for the crime of theft. I stole the money, I got caught, I belong here. And upon hearing that, the duke shouted, You scoundrel, you do not belong here with all these honest men. Leave their company at once. And he forgave the man his crime and set him free because he was honest. Out came a calf. Moses turned to Aaron and he, told the whole, he turned to the whole nation and he said this. He said, who's on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? People who are on the Lord's side don't play dumb with God. We come clean with Him versus our sin. We don't try to cover it up. We continue to move forward and don't consider turning back. And we make our decision to accept and seriously serve God today, not tomorrow. Who is on the Lord's side? It's not people who play dumb with God. Heavenly Father, help us to be honest and deliberate people that serve you as those who are not man pleasers but endeavoring to do the will of God from our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name.